Hey there, morning all. Let's go ahead and get started. We are now encountering chapter four of our Bayes Rule textbook. Once again, I want to thank the previous cohorts for making these nice notes for us to follow with. And let's see what chapter four has for us. We're going to talk about the balance and sequentiality in Bayesian analyses. And as we can see, our learning objectives include to explore the balance influence of the prior and data on the posterior. We will see how our choice of prior model features and delicate balance between them can in fact the posterior. And we're gonna consider performing sequential Bayesian analysis. We will explore one of the coolest features of Bayesian analysis, how the posterior model evolves as it's updated with new data. That is, in previous chapters, we looked at the prior, the likelihood, and then the balance that struck between them was the posterior, but that was with updating our models with one new set of data. The sequentiality is that what if an experiment is performed more than one time and we get more than one update of the data, what we're going to consider today is what happens there. So first we remember we have our Bayes rule from chapter two and such. On the right top left of the numerator, we have our prior probability, and that's going to be multiplied by the likelihood on the top left, or sorry, the top right, the likelihood of the evidence, if that hypothesis is true, but likelihood itself is not a probability, so we need to rescale that. So we have the total probability or the priority probability there in the bottom right that the evidence is true. Combined Bayes rule co computes that quantity on the left-hand side, the posterior probability of the hypothesis. In this chapter, we're considering this example where three friends, let's call one of them a feminist, one of them clueless, and one of them op an optimist, to discuss the proportion represented by pi, of recent movies that passed the Bechdel test. The Bechdel test, I believe dating back to the 1980s, was the notion where we could measure the representation of women in film. So with these three descriptions, let's take a moment to build a prior and try to figure out which one goes with which description. So the graph in the middle, we've seen situations like this before was the Milgram example. Since the prior is skewed right or more of the information is towards the left, or the mode is a smaller number, we're going to connect the graph on the in the middle with the feminist, that is the person who is skeptical of the amount of representation of women in film. In contrast, the graph on the right implies that the representation is quite high, it's a, it's a larger proportion. So for the graph on the right, we're gonna associate that with the optimist. The graph on the left, you recognize as a uniform distribution, it's otherwise not implying some stance of the situation, of the measurement. So the graph on the left, we're going to associate with the clueless personality. From there, the three friends agree to review a sample of recent movies and record Y, which, the num which is the number of movies that passed the Bechdel test. In particular, this sample size can be small or can be larger, and we might want to keep track of how that affects our calculations. In the previous chapter, we looked at the beta binomial model, and we're going to consider random variable capital Y 
as a number of successes. So like before in the previous chapter, we'll build our prior with the beta distribution and then model the incoming data and up data that may update our, our distributions with the binomial distribution. What then happens is that thanks to how the, this setup creates conjugate priors, the updated distribution would also be a beta distribution. As you may suspect, if you have different priors, that will create different posterior distributions. One thing to consider is that the more certain the prior information, the smaller the prior variability. That is, in the, loosely speaking, the bell-shaped curves of the priors, if the assumption is more certain, then the bell-shaped curve will be thinner. There will be less variability. In the example, on the right, the optimus is more certain about their, about their feelings about the situation. Therefore, the variance is smaller for the graph on the right compared to the other settings here. So an informative prior says that it reflects specific information about the unknown variable with high certainty. Again, that's low variability. In contrast, the more vague the prior information, the greater the prior variability. In our examples, the graph on the left, without any further concentration of the probability density, the graph on the left has the largest variability. And amongst these three, we consider the graph or the prior on the left to be the, the vague prior. Because it because this diffuse prior reflects little specific information about the unknown variable, especially if it's a flat prior, which assigns equal prior probability to all possible values of the variable. So now we're going to consider how their different priors influence the posterior to their friends. We're going to treat this as an experiment. The incoming data is going to be the, the same for all three of these situations. But the three uh, people, they had different priors. So we'll see how that affects things. There is a data set where 20 recent movies were picked and then according to the Bechdel test, judged on whether or not they pass or fail. The previous cohort created and ran these nice codes. In amongst the 20 movies that were selected at random, nine of the 11 passed the Bechtel test. So that's a proportion of 45%. So now with that new information, we're gonna ask ourselves whose posterior distribution do you anticipate will look like the most like the scaled likelihood. That is whose posterior distribution understanding of the Bechtel test pass rate will most agree with the 45% rate in the observed data. Whose do you anticipate will look least like the scaled likelihood? 
So looking at these pictures or just thinking about the situation, the optimist whose prior in yellow was concentrated on the larger proportions on the right, their update is going to have to go all the way back down to a, an average of 45% for this scaled likelihood. And their posterior, keep in mind, is going to be between the yellow and blue. It's going to be somewhere in between. The crudest situation in the middle is curious. It started out with the flat prior, with the uniform distribution. Scaled likelihood in blue, once again, is averaging at 45%. So we're going to see what happens there. And then finally, the feminist on the left, prior in yellow, scaled likelihood in blue, it's going to have to increase its average from about 27%. The likelihood's average is 45%, and we're going to see what happens in between. But I'm thinking at the moment that the feminist prior is going to be most similar to its posterior distribution. So thanks to how the beta binomial distribution ca is carried out, we have a quick way of representing that with new beta distributions. And we discuss what would happen above. So just very quickly, the yellow prior and the blue likelihood get computed via Bayes rule. And then the posterior in green is now our updated distribution. So we see on the right with the optimist, because of the gap between the prior and the likelihood, the posterior distribution is maybe arguably far away from the prior. In the middle was the case of the flat prior was the clueless. We have the first instance of the beta distribution after this update process in here in green. And then finally on the left, once again, between the prior and yellow, like red and blue, we have the posterior striking a balance in between with a pro average proportion of about maybe 33%. Remember this whole time, we're asking about the proportion of movies that passed the Bechdel test. So at the moment, the feminist posterior distribution is updated to about 33%. The crudest posterior distribution is with an average of about 43%. Whereas with the optimist, their posterior distribution average is about maybe 67%. So now we're going to ask ourselves, well, what if they had different data? I mean, for, for one thing, what if the folks uh, conducting these surveys uh, have different, uh, different sample movies? Or what if someone has a short amount of time to perform the experiments, another person has a lot more time to perform the experiments, and in this context means that they could watch more movies. So we're going to vary the sample sizes. The three analysts below have a common prior, that is, they're all optimist in the context, and unique binomial likelihood functions. We mentioned that some, somewhat back in chapter three. Reflecting their different data, and that's all displayed below, whose posterior distribution do you anticipate will be most in sync with their data as visualized by the scale of likelihood, and whose posterior do you anticipate will be the least in sync? So you notice in the three graphs, Morteza looked at 13 movies, and says that six of them passed the Bechdel test. In the middle, Nadine looked at 63 movies, 
says that 29 of them passed the Bechdel test. And Ursula on the right rated 99 movies and said that 46 passed the Bechdel test. So again, what we're looking at right now is in the experiment, we are treating the prior as a control. The prior, the yellow distribution is the same in all three cases. We're mostly concentrated, in my opinion, on the sample sizes, 13, 63, and 99, and how that will affect things. Their likelihood from the binomial distribution is being shown in blue, but as we strike a balance to create the posterior distribution that will be in green, uh, do you think it would be closer to the blue, blue likelihood or the yellow prior? In other words, um, how do you think sample size will affect that? So the larger the sample size, the more insistent of the likelihood function. Or in other words, or kind of in the vice opposite sense, if you do not have much data, then more weight will go with the prior distribution. But if you have a lot of data, then more weight will be given to the likelihood function. And we'll see that here. The more insistent the likelihood, the more influence the data holds over the posterior. So on the left, in Morteza's case, was the arguably the smallest sample size, we have the green posterior distribution of striking a balance between yellow and blue, between prior and likelihood. But this green distribution is still um, nudging towards the prior. Now, as we move towards the middle, we can see the, in some sense, the green distribution moving towards the left is, is going closer and closer to the likelihood from the data in blue. And likewise, on the right, the posterior distribution matches more with the likelihood in blue than the prior in yellow, especially with the larger sample size and the more data to consider. So the posterior models were constructed with the same prior, but with different data. And once again, thanks to the conjugate prior aspect of the beta binomial distribution, we could model each posterior distribution with an updated beta distribution. We want to keep with the same theme that our Bayesian process strikes a balance between the prior and the data. So we saw that the grid of plots illustrates the balance and the posterior model that struck between the prior and the data. Each row, we're going to look at this grid here. Each row will co correspond to a unique prior model. and each column is unique set of data. So in other words, in the past couple of sections of the cohort note, notes, 4.2 was the experiment where we had the different priors, the feminist, crudist, and the optimist, but we had them update with the same data. Next in 4.3, we stuck with the same prior for the optimist, but then we had simulated uh, three different updates based partly on sample size. So here in the grid, we'll try to connect the ideas together with a three by three grid, nine, nine graphs. We will observe that the likelihood's insistence and correspondingly the data's influence over the posterior increases with sample size n which in turn, the influence of our prior diminishes as we amass new data. Further, the rate at which the posterior balance tips in favor of the data depends on the prior. 
So what that meant was in the top row was the optimist. The prior was in yellow, but as we build the posterior distributions in green, we could see that the green distributions are arguably far away from the prior because, because of how the data um, fell into place and just the sheer um, difference in averages. Whereas with the feminist in the second row, because perhaps the feminist was more aligned with what was going to take place with the data, the averages and modes are more similar to the to the prior for the second row for the feminist. And then finally, for the clueless or the flat prior in the third row, oh, we just get built into the beta binomial distribution and quickly um, depart from the uniform distribution. Also, we call the more informative the prior, that is the lower the variant of the variance in the prior, then the greater of its influence on the posterior. And this is probably a key note, especially if you go back and read the examples in the previous chapters, maybe it's a good idea to not um, have a strong opinion at the beginning when building your prior distribution. And maybe it's a good idea to let the process um, update your distribution rather than accidentally creating a restrictive situation at the beginning. And this is a neat point here. No matter the strength of all the discrepancies between the prior understanding of our proportion pi, the three analysts will come to a common posterior understanding in light of strong data. So as long as the process and the data are all valid, the, what happens as we see with the, with the green posterior distributions is that, especially in the next section, once we consider the sequential, the posterior distributions will get relatively close to each other. And that assures us that our Bayesian process will represent our situation well, um, even if we do not have great prior information. So recall in the Bayes rule R package, we could simulate the process and or visualize the process. Here we have the beta binomial model. We input the hyperparameters of the prior distribution into alpha and beta. We input the proportion of the incoming data with Y and N. Prior, once again in yellow, likelihood in blue, posterior in green. So we have an example plot here for the feminist. Got the new data and then the updated distribution there in green in between. Like what we saw in a previous chapter, we could use the summarized beta binomial model again with those inputs. The folks made a nice G cheat table for us. The prior has these parameters for the beta distribution, now has these parameters for the posterior distribution. The feminist uh, came in with a prior that 31% of movies would pass the Bechtel test. In this simulation, now 48% of movies pass the Bechtel test. It's a little difficult to see what's the rounded numbers, but the variance decreased as well. 
Now, I myself am a math major, consider myself to be a mathematician. The textbook did say, hey, if you want to skip the, the mathy parts of this, that's fine. But if you have taken some calculus, I think this section is pretty cool. Um, basically, it talks more about how I might have mentioned before that if you have an insistent pri prior, then the weight of the calculations will uh, stick closer to the prior distribution than the likelihood. But if, on the other hand, if you have a vague prior, then the calculations will have a stronger weight for the incoming data and likelihood rather than the prior. And the mathematics um, is, is pretty neat. Okay, so finally, let's consider the sequential analysis. That is evolving with data or in, in other words, um, as more and more data comes in. So we're now running the underlying base rule, the, or in the R code, the simulated a process of the beta binomial distribution in these early chapters. But just thinking out loud, what would happen if we then had a second set of data, a third set of data, um, how, would, how would that affect things? To state the definition, sequential Bayesian analysis, or the, the other term, Bayesian learning, so cool. The posterior model is updated incrementally as more data comes in. With each new piece of data, the previous posterior model reflecting our understanding prior to observing this data becomes the new prior model. The previous posterior is now called a new prior. The textbook uh, goes over some of the underlying mathematics, but we could then be assured that the data order is invariant. So say if I conduct a survey in January, another survey in February, another survey in March, and then run the simulations, it doesn't matter if I go in that order, January, February, March, or if I just happen to run the simulations in a different order, such as March, January, February. Uh, what we end up with as far as our posterior distributions will actually be the same. So the data order is invariance. And we are also ensure, assured of ourselves that the final posterior depends only on the cumulative data and not the underlying um, order, such as February, March, January, that we might encounter. And this is also nice to know that this is an argument that when you're conducting experiments, running surveys, et cetera, that a larger sample sizes are better for our calculations. Okay, so along the way, I mentioned that the beta binomial model is at least mathematically um, exciting be because of what's called the conj conjugate priors. What we're gonna do next time in chapter five is look at more conjugate families and maybe more tools that we could play with. All right, folks, so that's gonna be it for today and we'll see you next time.